Fuel shaft flow is defined as Stokes flow between two parallel plates separated by an infinitesimally small gap. If you want to visualize what it looks like, we'll have the first parallel plate on top as such, the second parallel plate on the bottom, with fluid flowing between these two plates separated as previously stated by an infinitesimally small gap, which we will refer to as H. And we will define the coordinate system that we will use throughout this video for this direction as x1, this direction as x2, and finally, the vertical direction as x3. Now, to explore more about the the conditions of, of heel shaft flow, we must first look at the parameters that we must look at when we're analyzing this type of flow. So the first parameter or condition that we must satisfy is that the, um, the motion is Newtonian. I mean, the fluid is Newtonian. And second, the fluid is incompressible. And lastly, thermal effects are negligible. And from these parameters and conditions arise characteristics of, of heel shaft flow. And the unique characteristics of Hirschhoff flow is number one, viscosity is dominant. Because the because the the gap between the two layers is so is so small, um, the boundary layer the the mo the interaction of the fluid with the boundary layer is very is very important, very significant here. So viscosity is very is so viscosity is dominant in this type of flow. So we have to take that into consideration. And second of all, we want to model this flow as laminar flow. And it, and it is through this approach that we will attempt to solve the, the equations of motion. We begin with the Navier-Stokes equation, so du dt plus u dot del of u is equal to negative 1 over our density rho times del of our pressure differential p star minus our viscosity eta over rho times del cross our vorticity omega. Now, because our flow is laminar and we're dealing with steady state flow, we know two things. One, du dt is equal to zero. And two, we assume that our flow is only in the x1 and x2 direction and the flow is negligible in the x3 direction. Therefore, u3 is equal to zero. Now, with these two consequences, we can reduce our Navier-Stokes equation to three sub-equations. u1 times ddx1 plus u2 ddx2 of our velocity in the x1 direction is equal to negative 1 over rho dp dx1 plus eta over rho times del cross vorticity in the x1 direction. That's our first one. Second equation is u1 ddx1 plus u2 d dx2 over velocity in the x2 direction is equal to negative 1 over rho 
times dp dx2 plus eta over rho times del cross omega in the second x2 direction. And finally, because u3 is 0, we have 0 is equal to negative 1 over rho times dp dx3. The main boundary conditions in our heel shaft flow is that at x3 equals 0 and at x3 equals h, our u1 and u2 are 0. This is due to the no-slip condition made possible by the viscosity of the fluid. So, if h is sufficiently small, it means that the first and second order derivatives of our velocity in the x1 and x2 directions are negligibly small compared to the derivative of the same order in the x3 direction. To write this out, second derivative in the x1 and x2 direction of our velocity u is much smaller than the second derivative in the x3 direction of that same velocity u where j is equal to 1 and 2. Using the same logic and also with a viscosity that is sufficiently large, we have the following consequence. u1 ddx1 plus u2 ddx2 of our velocity, uj, is much smaller than our viscosity, eta, over our density, rho, times the second derivative of the velocity in the x3 direction. With this, we can simplify our first three equations to the following. dp dx1 is equal to our viscosity times the second derivative of u1 in the x3 direction. dp dx2 is equal, again, to our viscosity times the second derivative of u2 in the x3 direction and dp dx3 is equal to 0. These equations, particularly the third one, show that our pressure is not dependent on x3. Therefore, our velocities u1 and u2 can only be functions of up to 2 degrees. Therefore, our differential, equations, or our, our differential solution to these equations is that u1 is going to be equal to a times x3. times x3 minus h. Now the reason that we have these conditions is due to, or rather, the reason that we have that our equation takes this form is because of our boundary conditions. If you remember, at x3 equals 0 or x3 equals to h, u1 and u2 are equal to 0. Also, let me change this 
to be j because this applies to both u1 and u2. Now we see that this is a second order equation because we have a factor of x3 squared, but it also satisfies our boundary conditions that at x equals 0 and at x2 equals h, our uj is equal to 0. Now, let's just rewrite that equation. Okay, now, our average velocity between the two plates, defined as u bar, is 1 over h times the integral of our velocity with respect to x3 from 0 to h. Now, if we're dealing with flow in the u1 direction, this is going to be u1 bar is equal to 1 over h times the integral from 0 to h of u1 dx3. Now, we plug in this equation for u1, and we have that u1 bar is equal to 1 over h times the integral from 0 to h of a x3 squared minus a h x3 and all of this with respect to x3. We can then split the integral to the two components and expand to get that this is equal to 1 over h times a over 3 times x3 cubed minus a h over 2 times x3 squared evaluated at 0 and at h. This is then equal to 1 over h times a over 3 h cubed minus a over 2 h squared which is Oh, sorry, this is actually h cubed. And this leaves us with a over h times 2h to the third minus 3h to the third all over 6, which is negative a h squared over 6, which is u1 barred, if you see back from the top. Therefore, a is equal to negative 6 u1 bar over h squared. Going back to our equation for u1 then, we have that u1 is equal to negative 6 u1 bar over h squared times x3, all that times x3 minus h, u2 is equal to minus 6 u2 bar over h square times x3 x3 minus h. Of course, where in both these equations, uj bar again is equal to 1 over h times integral from 0 to h of uj dx3. We can then plug in these values of u1 back into our original differential into our original differential equation consisting of p, and we get that dp dx1 
is equal to negative 12 eta over h squared times u1 bar dp dx2 is equal to negative 12 eta over h squared times u2 bar. And since we know that dp dx3 is equal to negative 12 eta over h squared times u3 bar, and this is all equal to 0, we finally arrive at our Heel-Shaw equation. which is that u bar is equal to minus h square over 12 eta times del of p.